Dave holds a master's degree in physics and astronomy from the University of Durham. He was a developer in the un to writing anti-fraud software in London before joining Stutthoil. So I guess anti-fraud is a good prerequisite in geology. Thank you for the introduction and um, apologize in advance if I don't speak geologist too well. Um, <laughs> geologist in our project, uh, Lynn Arneson here, um, has put me up to speaking about uh, our project. So here goes. Um, Coolin project uh, is uh, to attempt to do cuttings in um, image lithology interpretation with neural networks. Um, so just to check that everyone here is awake, I know we have quite a technical audience. Who here has trained a neural network? Hands up. Now keep them up if you've also been on a rig doing cuttings descriptions. Just one, okay, two. Okay, so you can, you can fall asleep now. Um, everyone else, um, pay attention. So uh, the Coolin project is um, in context uh, within Equinor, part of um, the digital subsurface uh, strategic project within uh, R&T. Um, and we are working closely alongside um, the Digital Center of Excellence, who I've stolen this slide from. We, in Equinor, we see quite a large potential in um, the application of digital technologies to various areas of our business. Uh, subsurface analytics is an important one of them, and what we've been discussing today. But uh, I think Cuttings Images is going to be a completely new data type for this session, so hopefully um, I can uh, tell you something new about that. Now, usually um, it's only those two people out in the audience who've been sat there out in the rig as an operations geologist looking at the cuttings as they come over the shakers. They'll write down what they see in a textual description and the samples will be bagged up and shipped off to uh, storage and possibly never ever seen again. Um, but actually going off and taking photographs of these uh, cutting samples gives us uh, access to a new data source. And with taking um, these samples every three to 10 meters of drilling, and we're drilling, well, we, we saw earlier those a uh, couple of hundred wells on the NCS every year, um, that can quickly overwhelm the capacity of humans to go through and look at every single image. So as we go down, we get a whole load of, of cuttings images. This is, this is terabytes of data. Um, can we use deep learning to go ahead and um, at least direct us to the places where we need to focus more attention? Um, you may have guessed the answer um, that we see is yes. Um, but in order to tell the story, um, I'm going to go touch a little bit on what deep learning is, um, what it can do, what it can't do, and what you need to, to go ahead and do it. So I always like bringing up this uh, comic, which comes from XKCD. Uh, back in 2014, trying to explain what is and isn't possible within computer science. Um, and back then, it was pretty easy. Everyone had a smartphone in their pocket, so they actually had a GPS locator on them. So they, it was relatively trivial to tell if a photo was taken in a national park. At, in 2014, we didn't know that actually, instead of taking um, a research team of multiple years to do computer vision telling if you've got a photograph of a bird or um, sandstone or chalk, actually what you need is a GPU and some training data. So deep learning, um, its strong points are that it, it is surprisingly accurate. Um, and um, you don't need to put in a lot of effort as a domain expert um, in terms of feature engineering. Um, and the speed of inference is pretty, pretty fast. However, there are some weaknesses which we need to address. Um, the huge computational requirements are obviously present, obviously um, improving um, 
constantly. But um, the, um, without that huge volume of data, it's very easy to overfit. And even with it, it's actually quite easy to overfit. Um, and with, when you're given a classifier, you, um, you, you force it to give you an answer. You, you, it has to decide for you, do I see this or do I see this? Um, it's unable to necessarily say, that, well, this is something I haven't seen before. Um, and that comes into the, the black box disadvantage of um, using neural networks. Um, it can be quite hard to interpret um, what's actually going on inside the neural network. Um, but um, this is something which is improving. Here is an example which I like showing that this um, neural network has classified uh, this husky as a wolf based on the snow that's around it. Um, so if we can ask the network what's it used to make its decisions, then maybe we can get a little bit more confidence in what it's told us. So the first thing that we've been addressing is um, obtaining the um, necessary training data. Um, we've um, had a company called Rockwash, based in North Wales, working for us. Um, in fact, uh, this study was uh, initially um, commissioned by uh, the NPD, so we have to thank them for um, kicking that uh, innovation off uh, for us. And there is a lot of, uh, lot of wells with a lot of data, images, and also XRF, which I'll come back on to later, um, available there for us. So maybe we can just uh, go ahead and Google this. Can we, can we just show these photos to um, the Google Cloud Vision API? It will be easy. It will be fairly cheap to do. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't really know geology. So, I mean, it, it's figured that this, it looks like gravel, yeah. Um, in fact, that is limestone. So it came up reasonably well. Um, but then we give it something else. It still thinks it's gravel. gravel. Um, but that sand, it thinks, is igneous. So maybe not. Um, the worst thing is, the deal breaker is that we have no way to teach it. Um, so we're going to have to go ahead and build neural networks ourselves. Now, fortunately for me, um, Anders and other people have explained exactly how neural networks work. So um, all I have to do is rip through the slide very quickly and say that a neural network is just going to connect our input data to um, our output layer um, through either fully connected or convolutional layers. We train it by giving it examples of um, what it, we want it to, to come out with, um, and it learns uh, weights in that neural network. Um, and then once we've trained it up, we can give it new examples to tell us what it sees. Um, to pick a neural network for, that we want to use for this was um, a little bit of a kind of um, weighing up between computational requirements and um, how accurate um, they could be. Um, I mean, in the end, we actually discovered that uh, many of them performed fairly equally on what we're doing. And um, best um, place to put our effort was actually um, curating the training data better. But just to um, give you a little bit of an insight into how much uh, compute power this requires, um, my standard Equinor laptop um, performs about 100 40 billion floating point operations a second. Um, now, a GPU, um, the uh, latest generation V100, um, is uh, about, um, yeah, 100 times that, um, so 14 teraflops. In fact, that's not quite true because um, if you add the specialized hardware that they've put in for doing deep learning, NVIDIA have noticed that people are quite keen on this these days, um, it's even 100 times um, more powerful than my, 1,000 times more powerful than my laptop. Um, but where do we get this? We've gone to the cloud, um, to AWS uh, for this. Now, the next slide is potentially a little bit uh, scary, but this is just to show that um, behind the scenes, we need to put together a fair bit of architecture to deliver this uh, to our end users. Um, I just give an idea of the technologies behind this um, with um, PyTorch, 
um, Python, and then front end served up with Node.js. So to train the network, we um, created our train test split, um, obtained lithology labels uh, from actually well logs, and that uh, gives us a, at least a, a new um, uh, source of uncertainty. Split up the images into different subcrops, use the um, PyTorch framework, as I mentioned, to uh, train um, a deep neural network architecture to distinguish 10 to 15 different lithology classes. Um, and then some additional tricks, uh, data augmentation, um, those sorts of things um, to try and uh, get the model to generalize as well as possible. Um, and we've actually got it down to about seven hours um, training and testing on a machine with four V100 GPUs on Amazon. Uh, so we give it uh, different crops from different lithologies, and then this is sort of our um, breakdown of the lithologies we have available for training. Uh, the accuracy that we receive is a little hard to quantify because we're comparing against um, uh, an analysis of the lithology, which is not made from the data source that we're actually looking at. It's made from well logs, and there can be um, tie issue between where we get the um, cuttings depth and uh, where we get the uh, log depth. Um, there can also be um, misclassifications uh, within that. However, um, this is a confusion matrix from one of our, the latest um, uh, experiments we've done. And um, hopefully, and thanks to Eric for explaining um, how these work, and thanks to Kim for explaining um, what uh, an F1 score is, I can convince you there that uh, apart from some um, confusion there between uh, sand grains and uh, silty sandstone, and maybe between claystone and silty claystone, this is actually performing um, surprisingly well. So all good. We've got um, a model. How are we going to um, deploy this? We can envisage a couple of different routes here. In the data center, um, we can um, try and really um, give massive horsepower to this, um, get, a, get the same machine that we had for um, training the network on, um, on the task. And we find that we can do um, about four images uh, for big JPEGs a second. Um, and that means that a typical well will be um, two, three, four minutes. Um, we also see that uh, this could be something that will be useful to um, employ on a rig. Instead of sending uh, large JPEG files back every um, few minutes to shore, uh, which eat up quite a lot of bandwidth, we can envisage the idea that we could make an embedded tool. Um, so on the rig, um, we could um, basically have um, sort of extreme compression algorithm that um, takes the cuttings photos and summarizes it um, back to shore. And I said that um, trying to visualize and what, understand how you can trust what's going on here um, is an important thing to do. Um, so one thing that we've put into this uh, when we're doing inferencing is trying to show which region in the image. This is not a segmentation network. This is just um, taking crops from different parts in the original image and um, giving a sort of heat map for different lithologies. You can see um, carbonates highlighted in blue up to the top right there, um, sands um, and a few bits of pieces of claystone and shale um, down towards the center and left of uh, that image. Um, we also like looking into the um, uh, different layers in the network, trying to see what they respond to um, and uh, these are sort of maximum excitation images um, created by um, taking the gradients back through the network. Um, we see that actually it's picking out things which kind of look like um, very stylized rocks, very stylized cuttings. Um, and then to deliver all of this to um, people who are actually uh, looking at the wells, trying to understand um, better the subsurface, uh, we're able to um, deliver them a plot with um, all the different uh, interpretations at each depth that it makes. So it can give some idea, some idea of uncertainty at each depth, um, but also 
um, some um, yeah, um, idea of how that um, compares with the log interpretation. Um, display a few logs alongside it. A uh, composite view of all the images in the well is quite nice for um, sort of picking out uh, cold strata um, in particular. And then um, that's a case where we have log interpretation. And another case, we actually have the XRF data, which I mentioned before. Um, and um, we've uh, performed a Heron classification on that to take a look at how that compares with the uh, pure image uh, uh, analysis. XRF, I should probably um, say, that's uh, X-ray fluorescence, trying to work out what the elements, elemental composition is. Um, so um, that uh, actually ties quite nicely with what we're able to get from the raw cuttings images alone. And then um, people can drill down into um, having a look at all the images individually and uh, understanding where there may be differences between different interpretations from the logs, from the cuttings, um, from other uh, methods of inference of lithology. So I hope I've convinced you. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the team who've been um, working on this. It's been uh, a lot of fun. We've had um, uh, Raymond Beaker, Xiaopeng Yu, um, Pierre, working on the data science side of this, um, and uh, the geologist translating, uh, translating into, into geologist for me um, have been uh, Lynn, Arneson, Olafin, Anna Christine, and Ulrich. Thank you. Oh, we have time for one question. Oh, yes, there's a question. Thank you. Um, it seems to me like you, you you can try to be smart in the way you train, so you can pick good training data. So like you, yep. if you look at that confusion matrix, sometimes it's very easy to classify, sometimes it's hard to classify. So you would like to get training data that can pull you towards ones on the diagonal. So do you do any active learning value information like stuff to 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 find the right training data? That is coming. Um, so we've taken um, some time to actually try and uh, refine what we're using as our um, training data. Um, and that is actually a pretty important part of where we see this going forward. And um, actually when we displaying um, those plots back to the um, users saying, okay, out of this, where do you disagree? Um, please feed that back to us and enable us to build a better model going forward. <laughs>